I read a piece recently by a journalist. A man had met with a group of journalists and told them about his experiment that for four years he stay away from newspapers and magazines and other things like that, and told them that he was feeling a lot healthier, both mentally and physically, as a result. And so, of course, the journalist writes an article about how, yes, perhaps the news cycles are invading our minds a little bit too much. But if you don't keep up on world affairs, you're a narrow person, she said. And so she ended up justifying the fact that the news cycle is still invading our minds, that somehow it makes us better people, to know lots of information about things that we have no control over. It's not bad to be informed, but you have to realize that there is a really important part of your life where you do have some control, and that tends to be overlooked by everybody. And those are the machinations of your own mind right here and now. That's the important news, because that's an area where you do have some control, and yet we relinquish control because we're focusing on other things. So it's really important that we focus in on here, because this is really where you, you can make a difference. When the mind chooses to focus on the breath or on something else, there is a moment where you can influence that choice. All too often we're aware of the fact that the choice was made and we're off someplace else. But that's because we've gotten so used to throwing up barriers in the mind. Pay attention to something only when it's full-blown. But it's important as a meditator that you get to look at the process earlier and earlier on. And how do you do that? Well, not by simply just watching everything arising and passing away, because what you're focusing on is just basically surfing from one full-blown thought to another full-blown thought. What you have to do is sense that a thought has arisen and just cut it off as quickly as you can. And when another thought arises, cut that off even more quickly. And in the meantime, stay with a breath. An image I found useful is a spider on a web. The spider has its spot, usually in the corner of the web. This is where the image doesn't quite work. Cause for the mind, it works best if you're someplace in the middle of the body, or at least on that line from the very top of your head down through the center of the body, someplace in there. And you begin to notice that as a thought begins to form, there's going to be a pattern of tension someplace in the body. You immediately go there, unravel the tension, and come right back. And the more quickly you can do this, the closer and closer you get to the beginning of the stirring in that energy field. Because there's a point where it could either be simply a physical event or it could be something mental. The mind has this habit of clamping on these things going in the body and suddenly deciding whether it's going to be read as a mental event or read as a physical event. If it's a mental event, then you run with it deciding that it's a thought about X, and then you get involved in weaving the thought world. And so the first lesson you have to learn about this is if you're weaving something, you don't have to complete the weave. Just let it drop with all these unraveled ends. That compulsion to complete a thought and then let go of it, that's something you've got to fight. And then as you get quicker and quicker, you get earlier and earlier in the stage of the weaving until you get to that point where you've, the mind is making a choice. It's chosen already that it's a thought, but then the next choice is, do you want to run with it? And then if you get quicker than that, you get to the point where it's choosing whether it's a physical event or a mental event. 
And as you get closer and closer to the beginning of these points in the process, the more ar arbitrary the whole thing becomes. This is one of the ways in which you develop discernment through the practice of perfecting or mastering your concentration. All too often it's thought that you work on concentration and then you set aside the concentration and you work on insight. But that's not how the Buddha taught it. That's not how the Ajahns taught it. It's in the process of developing the mind in concentration that you learn a lot of things about the processes of the mind. And not only seeing the processes, but seeing them as fabrication. And when you see them as fabrication, you begin to realize this is pretty arbitrary. You can, it's very easy to develop a sense of dispassion, disenchantment around these things. So it's worth your while to spend a lot of time on the mechanics of your concentration. Because in the mechanics of the concentration, you see the mechanics of the mind. Same with the precepts. And John Cha has a nice passage where he says in the very beginning you've got really got to care, take very, very careful, pay very, very careful attention to your precepts to the point where you get obsessive about it. And he says, okay, even though you may be going overboard, it's an important stage in the practice. Don't short circuit it by saying, well, I'm getting overboard, I better relax and just kind of have a more easygoing attitude toward the precepts. It's in the desire to get things right and to begin to notice areas where you have been unskillful and you didn't see it before. And this is how you get more and more sensitive, by saying, oh, I Something that I thought was actually okay is not okay, or an area where I thought I could fudge the precept. You can't really fudge it. You've got to be careful. And some people feel, well, if it, you know it's a stage you're going to go through, you're just going to skip the stage. No, you've got to go through the stage, because it's in this way that the mind gets more sensitive. Your discernment, your mindfulness, your alertness, your discernment gets more and more refined. Because as you begin to realize the implications of your actions, as you never noticed before. And if you can't do this with your words and deeds, there's no way you're going to be able to do it with the subtle movements of the mind. It's in seeing cause and effect, and particularly the difference between a skillful way of speaking and an unskillful way of speaking, a skillful way of acting and an unskillful way of acting, and noticing the ramifications of your words and deeds. That's how you develop the sensitivity and the quickness to know the even more subtle ramifications of events in the mind. So it's in the very meticulous practice of the precepts and the very meticulous attention you pay to making sure the mind really does stay with the breath, really does stay with your object of concentration. That's how discernment develops. It's not that you rush through the precepts or rush through concentration so you can quickly get to the goal. On the one hand, there is a sense of urgency, but you don't want the urgency to make you rush in ways that you start getting sloppy. The urgency, the energy of the urgency, should be focused on doing things very meticulously, being very responsible about your your precepts, being very responsible about your concentration. Because what is it we're studying? We're not studying something that's in books. We're studying the movements of our own minds. And you see those movements most clearly as you try to clean up your precepts, as you try to make your concentration more solid. This is the point that Ajahn Chah gets to when he constantly is talking about how virtue, concentration, and discernment are all the same thing. It's not that you pick up one and then drop it, drop it when you go on, on to the next. You just get better and better at this one thing. And that's how all, 
all the aspects of the path grow together. <laughs> 